Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Deruzza, and this is the Trust Psyche Podcast on astrology and depth psychology. I'm a psychotherapist, astrologer, and teacher, and you can find me at trustpsyche.com where you can begin studying astrology with me today. Thank you so much for being here with me. I really appreciate you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. I'm here for my self-care. If I go too long without recording these, I go crazy. Today is December 4th, 2021, and we're just coming out the other side of this south node solar eclipse in Sagittarius. I have the great privilege of being joined today by Travis Deritza. Hi, Jessica. Thanks for having me. Hi, Travi Bear. We're here in our closet. (laughs) (laughs) And um, we wanted to take this time to connect with each other and all of you around uh, all of our astrological musings and what's on our heart, but specifically wanting to focus on uh, Venus retrograde. That's coming up here on the horizon for all of us starting December 19th through January 29th. Uh And it goes from 26 degrees Capricorn all the way back to 11 degrees Capricorn. So for 40 days and for 40 nights, we're going to be in this Venus retrograde. And I already feel... As Venus is slowing down right now in the sky, just a few degrees off from where she's going to station retrograde, uh, that we're already in the opening of this transit. So I just want us to open up the field here between us. I think that, you know, a lot of what's going on for us personally is... We're raising our daughter, Luce, Sophia. She's now 13 and a half months, so we made it through the first year of her life. And um, overall, it's, you know, getting easier and easier as we all find our rhythm and groove together. Uh, But this week in particular, she's in some form of sleep regression, which happens for all children at different stages and so she's literally been waking up every hour in the night Mm. so she typically sleeps 11 to 12 hours at night like roughly seven to seven and i kid you not every hour she's been waking up and usually daddy's the one that gets up with her in the night but mama took a turn last night and i'll tell you that shit alters you Mama's got some sympathy for daddy now. I always have sympathy for you. (laughs) I always have sympathy for you. It just... Visceral sympathy. Yeah, okay. Visceral sympathy. It's tough, man. It's tough. Sleep deprivation's tough. It's... I don't know. Some people say, oh, it comes with the job. I'm like, well, that might be the case. And yes, we all obviously survive it. But... um. Talk about sometimes being brought to your knees or just kind of really to the edge of what you think is possible for yourself. (laughs) Parenting is no joke. No, that is for sure. Not for the faint of heart. But at that same time, I mean, she's just so happy. She's an utter delight. And she is uh, uh, walking uh, each day and she is very talkative she's uh gemini rising and has mercury uranus so she said she has said so many words her first word she ever said was wow <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow 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 and this week she said hello santa baby banana banana kind of sounded a little more like nana yeah but... She can say grandpa, um, she says mama and dada. Bye-bye, of course. Uh, yes, she loves bye-bye. Her, her favorite. She loves waving and saying bye-bye. 
and she always waves at everyone. She waves at the moon. Every time she sees the moon, mm-hmm. she waves. So that's our little mini loose update. She might come <laughs> in, not literally, but physically, but we'll see how she wants to appear throughout this session. She's always with us. <laughs> <laughs> so entering into Venus Station Retrograde, this particular one is conjunct Pluto in Capricorn. So it's not just a Venus Retrograde, it's a Venus-Pluto conjunction. And I think that's probably one of the most signifying qualities of this time period. I mean, we're already in a Venus-Pluto conjunction right now mm-hmm. while we're recording this. We've been in it already for I think really the last two weeks. Um, so we've been we've been feeling that too, the Venus retrograde approaching, and also just the the field of the Venus Pluto. So I actually want to go a lot into Venus Pluto themes, and Venus retrograde themes. So as we feel into how we want to open this, um, I don't know, Travis. You've been giving astrology readings, <laughs> and yes, I, I have, have not. So, yes, have. <laughs> and I know the folks you've been giving readings to have had Venus Pluto. Venus Pluto has been up in the field for sure. Mm. So I feel like, in a way, you're kind of more tuned in on that level, where I've been seeing it more um, with my therapy clients. Mm. Mm-hmm. Is there anything you wanna just share here? Well, I've found with this Venus Pluto coming up and in the field, I've um, I've been I've been thinking a lot about the Persephone myth, and I have talked about this and shared uh, this with several clients. Kind of brought this story in, wove it in, and just really found it powerful in in several cases for for folks to to feel into that story. Um, Persephone ab- abducted by Hades, li- literally Pluto. In Greek, Hades taken to the underworld. Um, again, this is this doubling down of the, the Venus retrograde and the Venus Pluto. Um, and just thinking about what this story tells us about the rebirth of the feminine, about the rebirth of love after the dark night, rebirth of connection. People have been really challenged in relationship, I think, recently, and especially over the last couple of years. Everything we've gone through, we've been going through a kind of collective dark night, and I think all of our interpersonal relationships have been tested because of that. There are less resources to go around, just thinking of Venus as resources in general, Um, and that really puts strain on everyone involved in those resource networks, our family, our friends, our wider community. And when the chips are down and the going gets tough, you know, people's dark side comes, comes out, and that can disturb us when we encounter it, that can disturb us when we experience it in ourself. And so myself and a lot, I think a lot of folks around me have been have been tested in relationship and I think this period that we're coming into is uh, a special time where we can reflect on all the ways that we've been tested in relationship, all the nitty-gritty and challenging parts that we've had to encounter because of the scarcity around us and to reevaluate our relationships, to feel into what's really serving us and what isn't, to feel into how we're showing up in relationship and to use this retrograde to keep our relationships clean clear and clean because clear is kind as we've been saying lately I 
And I think that coming from a clear place, because clear is kind, is something that um, I can only do when I slow down enough to really be with myself um, and what I'm feeling and what my needs are, which takes time to get clarity around and to um, act and make decisions as best as possible from a clear, centered place. And I think that that can be a challenging thing to do um, in general, but I also think it can be a challenging thing to do around the holidays. Hmm. A phrase that's been coming to me around this Venus retrograde is entering into the sacred night and thinking about the holy number of 40 days and the 40 hmm. days and 40 nights that corresponds to Venus going retrograde. And that going into this sacred night, which then also overlaps with the holidays, and in the Northern Hemisphere, we're here approaching the winter solstice, um, it really does have this feeling of entering into the sacred night at the end of the year. Mm. And I think that um, for most of us, the holidays can be quite activating, um, you know, depending on where we're at with our family and friends, um, depending on how things are going uh, with our parents and our siblings and our children, um, depending on where the locus of tradition lies, whether or not we feel uh, that we belong or not. And um, typically, if we're having any kind of emotional or relational problems or suffering, it tends to get um, exacerbated or amplified during the holidays. So when you add in that Venus-Pluto is conjunct and she'll go retrograde, which means that it prolongs this conjunction from which would typically be a couple weeks to several months, um, we're really entering a, pro a profound portal here of what this energy is calling in. And I think that what you're speaking to, Travis, is truth. And um, for me, a lot of my practice as of late has been um, really finding that balance between power and vulnerability hmm. and the vulnerability of me being honest about how I really feel in my relationships and Venus is our relationships. It's our romantic relationship and partnerships. It's our friendships and, um, as Esther Perel says, uh, the quality of our relationships makes up the quality of our life. And so Venus deeply presents us with Pluto there to the quality of how all our relationships are doing. I like what you're saying here. It makes me think about how, you know, being empowered in relationship isn't just about being nice and making everybody like you all the time. You know, sometimes we all want to be liked. We all want to get along with others. We all want uh, others to be drawn to us and to, and to like us. And, you know, sometimes that prompts us to to be yes sayers, um, so that the relationship maintains, so that we re receive that positive feedback. But just leaning too much on that kind of shiny bright side of Venus can really be disempowering. And sometimes 
it's disempowering in a way that we're unconscious of. Mm-hmm. It's kind of double side of, of Pluto and that our desire to stay in relationship and to, uh, you know, feel that seeming positive flow of energy makes us unconscious to the fact that our needs aren't really being met. Um, because really being empowered in relationship means saying no sometimes. It means having boundaries. It means getting clear with yourself and then speaking up for yourself, which isn't an easy thing to do. But I think that the archetypal field that's entering here, it's asking that of us. And if we're not willing to step up to being empowered in that way in relationship, well, then Pluto is going to manifest as being unconscious Mm -hmm. in relationship. Right, which then you start to see what we'd classically call the shadow sides of Venus-Pluto, things like um, manipulation and Mm -hmm. coercion. I think that something that is can be very common when we're coming from a hurt place or a place of not feeling valued i think venus has a lot to do with value and worth Mm. and venus pluto i think really hones in on ways that we perhaps are not feeling valued in our relationships and if we're not feeling valued we're not feeling seen or appreciated in our relationships then that kind of darker side of Pluto, that unconscious side, as you're saying, as it relates to the unconscious, then can show up in forms of things um, that can be manipulative. And oftentimes when we're being manipulative, we don't even realize that we're being manipulative. That's the thing about it is it's so unconscious. If you would ask someone, well, you know, um, were you, were you being manipulative? You know, it's like, no, of course not. And it's like, well, let's slow down and really think about that. And so some kind of tell tell signs of manipulation, um, one is not being clear, right? If you're not being clear with yourself, you're not being clear with others. If there's not a sense of honesty and transparency, you're not giving the full whole picture, then it's, there's perhaps some manipulation going on there. Um, but also, um, I noticed with Venus Pluto a tendency for both triangulation and um, uh, secrets or messages being passed through mm. another th- third party. So instead of there being direct, clear communication around said hurt or pain of perhaps not feeling valued or seen, there's a way of kind of going behind another person's back and speaking in privacy or secrecy and passing messages around and through. I mean, how's that for imagery? It's like the message needs to, the relationship needs to pass through the underworld Mm -hmm. before it reaches the other person. Mm -hmm. There's, there's not a direct line of communication, but it has to pass through a third party, turn a corner, go under. And what happens, you know, what happens in that space in between what happens uh in that obscurity Mm. Mm. i think there are ways that we can get triangulated or involved in other people's business on a psychic and energetic level that's not ours to hold without even being conscious of it Mm -hmm. and i've really been noticing this recently in our life where we know we're going along and our, we're you know in a good mood or our day is going well we're in a good flow and then we um, have a conversation with someone and all of a sudden we feel like a like a really intense magnet venus pluto of being pulled in to mm-hmm. somebody else's drama that's also venus pluto mm-hmm. getting pulled into or sucked into through a kind of seductive allurement Mm -hmm. of somebody else's stuff. I mean, really, somebody else's bullshit, but somebody else's drama, which is very real to them. I mean, hurt is real. But what we do with that and the what we create from that, I mean, as one person said, if we're not seen, we create a scene. (laughs) If we're not seen, we create a scene. I think it goes in line with if we're not feeling valued, what drama might we create so that we can, you know, feel 
like we're getting seen so we can feel a sense of you know value that isn't going to actually satisfy what's going on there but that temporarily gives us a sense of i think false power Mm -hmm. um so i've just been super heightened to that recently and like you're saying practicing saying no saying you know what i don't want to be a part of this or i don't want to know this or you know something we've been practicing lately is um when we're hanging out with someone i don't want to talk about other people like i don't want to hear about other people like it's okay to share about what's going on like in your family's life or something but i don't i don't want to hear like essentially i don't want to hear gossip pretty much yeah i mean because there's something seductive about gossip on the one hand, but I think energetically it does do this thing that you're that you're talking about. It it circulates the energy that isn't that isn't yours. And if you're especially if you're a psychically permeable person, you can end up taking taking some of that on. You know, and and then what do you do with it? And you get home and you feel kind of weird and you say, Oh, what what is that? And this other practice that we've been working on is is handing it back mm. when that happens. You know, if amazing if if you're on point enough to to do it in real time and and nip it in the bud and stop it or hand it back right there, but sometimes you don't even oftentimes you don't even realize it happened till you get home later and you feel weird and we have to kind of be like what what happened? You know, we were having such a, a lovely day and then something got funny and we have to kind of talk about it and and figure it out. Yeah. And then once we do finding some way to hand it back and whether that be literally saying something about it to the person involved taking some kind of energetic step um Mm. or or different steps in between perhaps Mm. um but addressing it so it doesn't stay lodged in you i think this is big right now with the holidays Mm -hmm. and family you know right it's really common within the family to talk about each other you know, and sometimes behind each other's backs or, you know, not even necessarily in a vindictive way can be, but just, you know, saying something about another family member when they're not present that you would not say to their face, you know, I think that's something I'm also just not interested in. I'm like, no, I don't want to have these conversations. I'm not interested in talking about anybody else who's not present. That's something I'm not going to be saying directly to them. I don't want to spend our precious resource of time venus at venus and pluto both relating to resources in different ways i mean thinking of that second eighth house relationship Mm. of taurus scorpio Mm -hmm. you know venus ruling the second and pluto ruling the eighth there's a profound access here of resources and use of resources Mm -hmm. and resources yeah uh, you know our most precious precious resource time but you know resources are also a social thing right and so how do we spend our time together and the quality of that time and i just more and more i'm like because my time is so limited with you know having a daughter and you know having to give so much to her and 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 um when we have a little bit of time and we're spending it with other people i need it to be of high quality absolutely i need to be nourished on a soul level by that because right now for me the choice is either um sleeping (laughs) being by myself uh getting one of a billion things done that i haven't been able to or hanging out with you well hanging out with you has to seriously pardon my use of this word trump those (laughs) other things Mm -hmm. um which means i need a quality of care and attention and presence which for me is an act of love and respect from the other person to say hey this is precious that we're getting to hang out together right now. I mean, this has been one of the most amazing and empowering things about having a child, how much it has raised the bar for the quality of my interactions and just just really, you know, cut my uh, tolerance for bullshit, you know, down to, to just about zero. I mean, things that I used to put up with, ways I used to spend my time, when there's no time anymore... Uh, you know, you're really a lot more discerning about those things. Something, you know, empowering Pluto that's come from 
this new relationship with our little one, Venus? I think that, you know, for me, there's a lot of life that becomes very routine with a child. Like you're mm-hmm. on a schedule. She gets up at the same time, goes to bed at the same time, the eating, the naps, right? So it becomes very kind of sixth house and all a bit quotidian and just da dun da dun da dun da da right? And so whenever we're not doing that, which would be, let's say, let's stick with Venus in this socializing aspect of it, socializing with friends or family, it's special. It's different than the usual rhythm that we have to be in. And so I have a heightened awareness to the sacredness and the preciousness of getting that social time together. And what I would like from the other people that I'm socializing with is for all of us to hold together in an act of love that what we're doing isn't throwaway. There's nothing um, every day about it. And I think we can all relate to this now because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right? We all know what it's like to be stripped or ripped away from community and friends and family Mm -hmm. for a prolonged period of time that has sometimes been excruciating and caused mental health problems and spiritual issues. Like, this has been a really hard time. And so I want everyone to wake up and say, hey, when we're together, let's treat it as such. Yeah, this is great. The preciousness of relationship as a resource mm. and not not to not to undervalue that resource not to undervalue the preciousness of it mm. and we've all had to feel yeah what it, what it feels like to, to have that taken away from us to have our communities and our interpersonal world taken away from us because of the pandemic or in our specific case because so much of our energy now goes to our nuclear family but in both cases i think that it forces us to reevaluate, reevaluate what we want in relationship and what we're getting in those moments that we're spending together with others. I think that um, when you talked about, when, when you reinforced the preciousness, it made me think of Venus Pluto in relationship to like precious stones hmm. and how uh, you're actually, this is so funny. You remember back at um, CIS when, uh, I gave my talk on the heroine, uh, the heroine's journey mm-hmm. through the underworld and getting right. the treasures and boons there. I just the reason I'm laughing about that is because I just have this visual. I'm like up in front of the room, and this this room is called Namaste. There uh, in San Francisco, where Travis and I met at the school, and uh, I was up in the front of the room giving this talk, and Trav walked in late, and he came in and he plopped down right in the front. And I just will never forget seeing you come in. We were not together yet. We weren't even Barely really friends yet. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm just, but anyways, I'm just thinking about Pluto's relationship to the underworld and mm. that descent into the underworld um, to find the treasure that's there and thinking of these precious stones um, that we find. Yeah. And I mean, this is, this is kind of Persephone again, and this is uh, Inanna. Inanna as well. Uh, the descent, the descent of the heroine into into the underworld, mm-hmm. and bringing back that treasure to renew the community. And I think that it's a question of whether or not we want to go into the sacred night. You know, it's a choice. Mm. We get to make the choice. Do you want to go into the sacred night? Do you want to disrobe? Do you want to ride the dragon? Do you want to follow, you know, the trail into the underworld to see what's there? Um, and you don't have to, and maybe this isn't the right time and that's okay, but there is a profound calling to do so right now, um, energetically, astrologically with the way that the planets are lining up, that there's a vibration that's inviting us in to say, okay, what pain might be in your heart? Where are you ailing in relationship? Where are the places where your soul is super nourished? How do you turn down the places it's not and turn up the places that it is, um, to get a lot less of what isn't serving you and a lot more of what is. And I think that's a big part of what this time is speaking to. Mm. 
yeah, I'll bring in just one other piece because I'm kind of seeing it uh, in the mythologic terms that we're talking about now too. So in, uh, partway through the Venus retrograde, Mercury turns retrograde as well. I just wanted to bring in the piece around communication here mm -hmm. and how important communication is to these reevaluations of relationship and I think the kind of transformation that's possible. I think some of what we've been talking about, the transformations in relationship are happening because transformations in the way that we communicate are happening. Mm -hmm. We're getting clearer about what we want, what we need, and then speaking that and living by it. And uh, I just have the image of it's after Persephone is, is abducted and taken to the underworld by Hades and Demeter causes you know, uh, none of the crops in the field to grow and whatnot. Uh, finally, the Olymp Olympians send Hermes, Mercury, down as, as an ambassador to talk about Hades about the situation because mm. Mercury, of course, is the only one who can pass into the underworld and pass back out, God of the Threshold. Um, and so we get this beautiful astrological image of in the middle of the dark night, mm. Hermes himself goes retrograde, goes into the underworld mm. to speak to Hades. Oh, interesting. And and bring this bring this dark night to a completion, bring us out to the other side. Uh-huh, right. And so astronomically... Mercury stations all the way back retrograde to about just the same degree that Venus goes station retrograde around like 27 ish um, Capricorn. And so there really is like a literal c connecting to that point. Yeah, no, and there's a moment there, there's a moment of a triple conjunction. They're all exact within a, within a degree. I forget if that's right, but I think it's right before Mercury goes, goes retrograde. But we're really getting the, co the coalescing of, of all three of uh these planetary gods mm. Mm. yeah because what i'm noticing is there's a real emergence of like old 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 um traumas and wounds of the heart and of relationship like i think for me if you can um ho ask yourself where and whom have i with whom have i been most wounded in relationship, um, I think that really tunes us in to probably some of the events and the psychic material that is coming up right now and the opportunities that are there to um, place loving attention toward those places that are needing some loving attention. And also, I think that you know, people classically say during Venus retrograde, like old relationships come up or old lovers come up, you know. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's so much more than that. It's um, where have our, where are places in the timeline of our life where our hearts have been locked away that perhaps we would like to unlock so that we can come back into the present moment in a, a richer, vaster, deeper, more full way mm. to love more deeply, to love more profoundly, mm. to love more openly, which is the gift of Venus Pluto. And mm. I also think the gift of the other side of the retrogradation. Mm. I mean, in thinking about that, maybe it's a, it's a good time to, to mention the eight year cycle. Mm. I liked what you were saying right before we started that you were, you were saying, Oh, Remember eight years ago, it was our it was our first Christmas together. Venus must have been retrograde then as well, because of course Venus returns to the same place in the sky every eight years, within a degree, on the same day. Venus has this really tight cycle that uh, divides evenly into the solar year. So because Venus's cycle is five hundred and eighty four days, if you run that cycle five times, five times 584, you're going to get eight years down to the day, just about. Um, and so because of that, every eight years, Venus is in the same, the same place. And every, uh, each of those five cycles of 584 days, Venus traces uh, a star, a pentagram in the zodiac. Uh, and 
this beautiful, elegant, elegant shape, turning our eyes up to the heavens. And so when you're thinking, thinking about these past wounds that Jessica mentioned, you know, one very literal astrological way to think about it is, where were you at eight years ago? What was happening during that Venus retrograde that's connected to this one after the entire star in the zodiac has been traced? Maybe that might give you some some insight into heartaches that are reemerging. Mm, I love that. I think it's, I think it's so incredible. I mean, you're the one that pointed out to me that Venus returns to the same degree every day, every eight years. And this is happening every day. Every day, right now, right, right now. now, right now. <laughs> which, which has been wild for Jessica and I because we're celebrating eight years since we f- first met and got together. And over the last months, we've been just traveling through that sequence of events from when we first met to the summer when we fell in love at Burning Man and the fall as our love unfolded and just tracking that and knowing every single day, wow, Venus is in the same place. And even on some of our anniversaries and special days where we had tracked that day, you know, we can literally look and see, oh, wow, yes, I remember Venus was there because, you know, we chose that as an, as an electional chart to, to do this or to do that or, or simply, you know, the chart from, from Burning Man. And mm. I remember, you know, Venus was was in the the Grand Cross with Jupiter, Uranus, Pluto, right? Right, yeah, and about the middle of Libra. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm just tuning into eight years ago in the last Venus retrograde uh, in um, Capricorn here like, that's connected to this cycle. And I was thinking about what happened, and I was thinking about my comment earlier about power and vulnerability, we had been together officially for one month by the time we celebrated our first Christmas. We had been spending more time than that together, but our zero anniversary is on November 21st. And it was coming time to the holidays, and we were living in San Francisco, and you always went home to Massachusetts to be with your mother, father, and two brothers. That You had never missed a Christmas going back. And so, you know, we hadn't been together very long, and here you were, and you were going to leave. And I wasn't going to be able to see you for a couple weeks, which was a really long Mm. time at that point, and Mm. I wasn't going to be able to celebrate our first Christmas together. Mm. And we were kind of talking about it, and you said to me, you know, because we're so new— I don't feel like I can bring you home yet, you know, to my family. And, you know, as much as I want to, I just feel like that's not really, you know, kind of how we do things there. And so um, I don't think we're going to be actually able to spend Christmas Day together. So I desperately wanted to find a way to spend Christmas together. And I didn't want to be alone. And I didn't want to spend that much time apart. And uh, a mutual friend of ours was planning to drive from San Francisco out to near Philadelphia uh, in his Jeep, his stick Jeep, to return it back home. Because he was getting too many fucking parking tickets in San Francisco. (laughs) If you live there, you know what we're talking about. Uh, And hurt your car broken into. (laughs) One or the other. Uh, so resources. he was looking for someone to drive the car back with him. And I was like, well, I'll do that. I'll do that. Cause at the very least I'll have something to do, but that only puts me a few hundred miles away from Travis. Within striking distance. Within striking distance <laughs> of Christmas and Travis. But I'm not going to ask Travis. I'm not going to be clear and kind. I'm going to be manipulative. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, that was. It was manipulative of me. Way to own it, honey. (laughs) Yeah, eight years later. It was manipulative of me. Took eight years for you to say that. I I called you up and I said, hey, guess what? You're never going to believe it, but our friend is driving across the country and I'm going to go with him to Philly. And you were like, when? I was like, over Christmas. I'll be there on Christmas Day. And then you were like well, um, do you want to come the day after Christmas to be with us? What am I supposed to say? Well, see you when I get back to SF. (laughs) (laughs) 
That action probably would have broken us up. Enjoy the East Coast without me. <laughs> oh, because the other part of it is that your tradition after going home for Christmas is you always go to New York City to visit all your friends that are there and your old stomping grounds. For New Year's. For New Year's. So I wasn't going to be with you for New Year's either. That's right. My heart ached. Talked about, talk about mm. Venus Pluto. Oh. Persephone in the underworld. Oh, it hurts so bad. It hurts so bad. And so I was like, oh, really? I would love to come the day after Christmas to be with you. How do I get there? You're like, well, here, I found this train for you. Hop this train and I'll come and I'll pick you up. I was like, really? Like all like innocent, like. I'll do it. Y'all do I can't believe it. And I just want to say officially on the record, that was manipulative and coercive. And I apologize for not being clear and kind because if I'd like to have a redo right now. Well, thank you, Jessica. Let's have a redo. Okay. Ring, ring. Hello. Hey, Travis. Oh, hi, Jess. I'm really missing you a lot for the holidays, and my heart is aching, and I feel really kind of vulnerable and embarrassed to say so. Oh, I miss you too. That's so sweet. Really? Yeah. <laughs> um... And well, I had this crazy idea, but I, I, I wanted to run it by you and see what you thought of it before I made my decision. Well, you know how much I love your crazy ideas. You know, that is one of the reasons why I fell in love, because you're only one of the only people who can handle it. <laughs> 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 when the rubber hits the road. <laughs> Which in this case is actually <laughs> what is, I'm talking about here. But <laughs> uh, our friends drive across the country, and there's a chance for me to drive with them and, and help out with the drive, even though I don't know how to drive stick, and I'm terrified. But anyways, um, I could be in Philly, and I could come see you. Like, I know I can't be there on Christmas Day, but I can maybe come, like, the next day. Wow, okay. Let me take that in for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you also said later when I asked you about children. Actually, that wasn't later. I asked you about kids two months before I asked you about this. I don't know why I'm nervous <laughs> asking about this, but anyways. I think that would be awesome. I'm going to check in with my family first and make sure that that's awesome for them too. But I would love to have you there. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. You check in with them. No pressure. Let me know what I can do. But in any case, we can certainly get together <gasps> for New York New Year's. And really? Every, every, oh, yeah. You have to come to New York, meet my friends out there. We'll have a raucous time in the city. Oh, my God. Okay, I'm so lit. Okay, you're saying I for sure can come. It's on, for sure. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. I'm so happy. I don't even need to come to Christmas anymore. <laughs> now that I know I can come to New York, but like I totally want to come to Christmas too and meet your family, though I'm slightly terrified. And I'm I have doing a good, it. I have a good feeling about this. They're gonna they're gonna say that sounds cool and we'll do our little Christmas thing and then we'll bring you in and they're gonna love you. It's gonna be awesome. Oh my gosh. Scene break. Okay. <laughs> I that felt healing. Scene, that was great. <laughs> I feel healed. I, I didn't know, actually. It took until the Venus return of this moment. And we realized I actually feel kind of bad about that, how I did that. That was. It was manipulative. Yeah, I felt I felt that it was, and I felt a, l a little bit manipulated. <laughs> <laughs> but you kind of liked it? Uh, uh, kind of, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I did want you to come. And, you know, see you after. I was excited to see you. <laughs> But it kind of felt like, uh, you know, I was in a little bit of a, there wasn't any way to say no. Yeah. <laughs> Even, I wanted to say yes. Luckily, I wanted to say yes was kind of, I mean, of course, of course I did. But mm. it was kind of like, if I had, you know, real stern parents who like s still had me wrapped around their finger and didn't want you to come, I would have been in a really impossible situation. Right. Luckily, I'm cool with my parents and they're cool. And, right. and they were like, sure, she can come the next day. Right. So we all won. Yes. Okay, well, <laughs> I officially am sorry about that. I was young and very... Um, uh, I still thought that was, like, kind of clever or, you know, whatever. But I, I can feel now in my heart of hearts that that was... All, and thank God it worked out. And thank God you said yes. Thank you. Um, I do remember when I showed up that, uh, you know, 
your family was very welcoming. But what I really remember was that uh, after the first night of sleeping up there on the third floor in the attic with you, uh, you brought me breakfast in bed. Yes, I did. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to do whatever it takes to be with this guy. Like, I know that I got some bullshit, like we all do, and I'm going to work really hard at it. So, hey, eight years, eight years later, I'm sorry. I accept your apology. <laughs> What do you want to do for this Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, I'll bring you breakfast to bed. Really? Yeah. Oh, it's so sweet. <laughs> Aww. And how far we've come. I know. How far you've come. Thank you. Well, a lot of it's in, inspired by you. I mean, you definitely keep me honest. You know? You. I want to... Um... I want to love you as best as I can, as clearly and as kindly as I can for who you are and, you know, everything that is the context of your life. So you are definitely a huge part. Like, lo loving you the best I can is definitely a huge part of what keeps me going. Transformational love. Yeah. Yay. May we always continue to transform one another. Oh, it is so. It is so. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that's the best side of Venus Pluto. Mm hmm You know? But, yeah, it takes a lot of time and honesty and reflection and it hum it's very humbling. I feel very humbled. I mean, that's what I really remember in the first months of our relationship, how humbled I was. I remember one time we were cooking in the kitchen with a friend, and I, I don't, I didn't cook. I'm going to say that in past tense. I didn't cook. And you were doing all the work, and I was just sitting there, you know, talking shit, entertaining. And you looked over at me, you're like, you could help. And I was like, what? I was like, I don't cook. I'm like, yeah, I'm helping. What do you mean? I'm entertaining him. You're like, yeah, okay. Well, the food doesn't cook itself, and the dishes don't clean itself, so like, you could help. And I just remember feeling so like, oh, foot in my mouth like what am I gonna say he's he like you're right but fuck you and like oh and I was like ah, you know I had a meltdown and I remember all you know the times <laughs> how just emotionally young I felt and just how much you've taught me about my emotional world and my psychological world and having to <sighs> To just slow down and, and, and learn to feel my feelings um, so that you don't have to feel them for me. Mm. And, you know, at first I always wanted to be like, that's, that's, not, that's not what's happening. Give me a break. <laughs> You're just sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, you never actually said oh, that because no, I would have kicked you in that. the nards. Of course not. I would Fucking... ne I'd never say such a thing. <laughs> oh, you would never say anything to anyone, but you would definitely not say it to me. I mean, I took a vow at the age of 12 that I would stop kicking men in the nuts, literally, because I was still fucking kicking them in the nuts when I didn't like what was happening. <sighs> so I actually haven't done that since then, but wow. Actually, that's a very kind of, that's maybe more of a Mars Pluto thing. I kind of like it, like a Venus but kicking or not. Anyways. Mm. Mm. Well, I think that that's something that connects with jealousy and its connection with Venus Pluto. And uh, jealousy, like anger, have, um, I don't know, I think a pretty profound connection, you know, because they're kind of on the continuum of negative less evolved human experiences and emotions. <laughs> and the only reason I bring this up is because when you're talking about feeling your feelings, I think a lot of times what happens in relationships is polarization. And this is something that I was really enjoying hearing Esther Perel talk about lately, which was she was saying that the opposite of paradox is polarization. Hmm. Like and this. that what happens within the psyche is we all contain everything, right? So we contain within ourselves um, independence and dependence the need for freedom and the need for safety but so too then do we each contain you know the one who wants to pursue and the one who wants to be pursued 
right? Just like we have all the planets in our chart and all the archetypes in our chart, we have all these aspects of psyche in us. But what happens in relationship is we often polarize. And so one person takes on the role of being jealous and the other person takes on the role of... Being independent. Yes. Being not having needs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. And what ends up happening is that in this these roles that we take on, it gets cemented over time and then we think that they're personality traits and we think that this is who we are. Um, yeah. I mean, on a large scale collective level, I mean, I kind of think this is what's endemic to patriarchy, that men take on all the quality of Mars and women take on all the qualities of Venus and this denial that we each have Mars and Venus within us and all the archetypes, as you were saying. It's mm. just a, a writ large example collectively. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I actually don't know how much I want to go down the jealousy track right now because I feel like that's its own entire episode. Sure. But I do just want to say there that I think that in our relationship, you know, um, I've been the one to experience more of the jealousy and the dependence and neediness, and you've been the one to experience more of the sense of self-possession and freedom and independence and we've worked really hard mm -hmm. to unlock us from those roles yeah. and to share in those experiences so that we both get to be jealous we both get to be free we both get to have anger we both get to have needs right mm -hmm. and how much it's um humanized us absolutely i mean just for me to experience my jealousy I feel like I had I went through life kind of you know thumbing my nose at that at that emotion you know thinking it was it was worthless and it had it had no place and you just taught you know taught me the value of jealousy and you know other of the the darker emotions and just understanding what purpose these serve in the psyche there's no feelings that are there for, for no reason that we just want to get rid of, you know, anger included. Um, and just being able to tap into that and feel it myself, I feel like it it opened up an entire emotional world for me that I didn't know I had. Mm -hmm. You know, the emotional transformation was, was, my, was my Venus, you know, Pluto experience mm. through our relationship. Mm-hmm being opened emotionally, being able to feel things I hadn't felt before mm. that were probably being felt for me by other people in the field. Mm. I just think that's one of the kind of most like profound and deepest understandings of field psychology and what's happening within the system, a family system, a couple system, a group system, whatever the level of the system is. And we can take that all the way out to national systems and geopolitical, et cetera. But that, um, yeah, jealousy is a part of the human experience that we all share and whether we're conscious of it or not. And when we're unconscious of it, then the other people around us have to feel it for us. Um, and that goes for so many of the more kind of, quote, challenging, you know, mm -hmm. or negative human experiences. Mm -hmm. So what else do we want to go into here um, before we have to go eat dinner? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought I'd just mention one uh, observational astronomical thing. Um, just if you, if you have the chance, I just encourage folks to get out there and see Venus in the evening sky as she's, she's just about to disappear here. So one of the cool astronomical things that happens is right around uh, the period in her cycle of Venus's heliacal set, which is when she gets close enough to the sun that she then disappears. So once she gets about within about 15 degrees of the sun, she's close enough that you can then no longer see her in the evening. So as she's been in the evening sky, she's getting lower and lower in the evening sky as you go out each night, and she's going to get low enough and close enough to the sun that finally you can't see her right around 15 degrees. And just about at that moment is also the moment that she turns retrograde. And this happens for both Mercury and Venus. Um, 
And so it's a nice way, observationally, to tune into the cycle, to see her slowly making her descent a little bit lower each night until she then disappears. And at that moment that she disappears, she has gone into the underworld behind the sun. We can't see her. And she has, she's turned retrograde. And so it's a nice, uh, it's a nice physical way to tune into the, the astronomy and the astrology that we're talking about. Huh, that's incredible. Hmm, that's very provocative for me. So yeah, I guess that mostly tunes me into is um, just the incredible research and preparation that you've been doing for your upcoming astrology course, which I cannot wait. It's going to happen right after um, Venus goes direct. It's going to start. So it's actually coming up here really soon in the new year. That's right. And I would just love for you to share a little bit about it because it's the next course offering that Trust Psyche is doing. Yeah, it's called uh, The Astronomy and Cultural History of Astrology. Um, it's going to run from February 6th to April 10th on Sundays from 1 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 10-week course. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to cover the whole history of astrology. We're going to start way back... Uh, with the megalithic stone circle, Stonehenge, the first kind of relationship when when the humans looked looked up to the heavens and and had this inclination of as above, so below, and started to trace what was going on there in these stone circles, and followed it up through Mesopotamia, where the zodiac was invented, uh, Egypt, where they really started to focus on the diurnal rotation. So you start to get notions of the ascendant and the culminating point, the midheaven. And how the synthesis of these tr two traditions, along with the Greek philosophy coming out of Plato and other folks, is really what creates Hellenistic astrology, which is kind of the, the touchstone of the astrology that we practice today. It's, it's when you get the four big pillars of astrology, the aspects, the signs, uh, the houses, and the planets, of course. Um, we'll trace it through the through the Hellenistic period, through the Roman Empire, Christianity, the decline of astrology in the Middle Ages, when the decline in learning, they didn't have the the techniques um, to to do the math and to to calculate the charts. And so ast astrology kind of disappears because there's this decline in learning. But meanwhile it's it's uh, in the Islamic Empire, they're taking the baton and astrology continues to grow and just like the Renaissance happens because of the reintroduction of these lost Greek texts that were transmitted uh, through the Islamic Empire. Astrology, too, undergoes th this amazing Renaissance in that period. Right up through the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution, a lot of times we think of the Enlightenment as where the death of astrology started, and it did eventually, but at that time, astrology was still very much alive and a lot of figures associated with the scientific revolution, like Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, Kepler, Galileo, uh, were either astrologers or had connections to astrology and magic. And finally, we'll follow that right up to the modern age, um, theosophy, and the sort of way that astrology found this new home in depth psychology, um, which is so close to what we do here uh, in Trust Psyche. So... I'm really excited to teach this course. It's going to be we're going to we're going to kind of follow the astronomy and see how the developments in the astronomy and the cultural inflections of each era, you know, changed the astrology and and carried it forward so that we understand uh where we came from with our art and it's going to help us to hopefully to change the way that we practice today, uh understanding our roots a little bit better. So there's a little little preview of the course. I'd love for you to join us. Um, I'm thrilled about it. You can uh, check it out on the Trust Psyche website. There's a description and everything to uh, sign up and register for the course. Yeah, so you go to trustpsyche.com slash astrology courses to see all our courses, and then you'll see the sign up for Travis's course, which I am totally impressed by what, everything you just said. I cannot wait to take it. Uh, I cannot wait to be in class with you. And I also can hear the um, flow and poetry and inspiration in your voice. And it's clear to me that you've been giving readings. Mm. I can hear the difference. 
I'm glad you can hear that. Yes, I love it. (laughs) I feel more fluent. (laughs) Yeah, you are clearly fluent. You have been not only researching and studying as the scholar that you are, but you've also been clinically embodying it and practicing it by giving the readings that you've been doing. You gave an amazing synastry reading this week. You've been working with individuals. You've been working with couples. You did a newborn reading. I did. Oh, my goodness. You're on fire. And they've been going so well. It's been so awesome to to sit down and to share space with these folks and to talk this language out loud more. (laughs) Um, It's an important part. Yeah, it really is. It's so important. And I'm always so impressed by Jessica's oral fluency and... I feel like I'm working on that part of myself and drinking it in for you. Well, clearly this eclipse is happening on your Mercury. That's right. And the profound opening of your voice. And that has come through so clearly today here on the podcast and what you shared about your course. And I know the readings that you've been doing. And I'm just so honored to um, be your partner and to be able to do what we love for a living and get to have this time in this space with all of you here with us. Thank you so, so, so much for being a part of Trust Psyche, for being a part of our life and our family and what we're here doing and loving each and every day. I know that I am sending you all my love and blessings for this holiday season, for this Venus retrograde, for this Venus Pluto, and um, this journey into the sacred night. And so awesome to sit with you here today and to talk about our love in our closet. <laughs> it's very appropriate, a uh, <laughs> Venus Pluto setting. <laughs> and we will, we will emerge from the dark night to uh, eat our dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are with the power of love to transform the deep exploration of friendship and vulnerability and sensitivity to our core wounds and the power that that has to heal by bringing loving attention to that which needs to be seen. I hope all of you have great love making, great art making, great family making, whatever this time is for you in these 40 days and 40 nights. And just remember, you always have a choice. We'll see you next time. We are dreamed into existence. What we do with that dream is up to us. How we dream is as important as what we dream. For the what of the dream knows itself through the how.